So I have a specific point I want to make this evening, so I don't intend to go a long, long time. And um, then I'm going to uh, go to our prayer request um, t first. And so if you have those, let's turn our attention to those. Um, uh, Ken's mother, I see, as the last person on the list under our sick, and she either was going to go back to her care facility today or tomorrow. Uh, she was much better yesterday. And so um, I talked with him for a good while this morning. So please um, keep him and them in mind. By the way, his timeline next week, um, they are supposed to go, the moving company, to pick up his things on Monday. This is the latest. And then they are staying at various places <laughs> during the week next week. On w next Wednesday, they close on the house that they're selling. And then on Friday, they're closing on the house that they're buying. And on Saturday, <laughs> they're probably moving into the house that they're buying. So they're going to be uh, homeless for uh, five or six days. And so just pray uh, for them as that's a lot of things to do in a relative short period of time. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of things on here. Donna Moore is on our list and she uh, had a, her knee to pop last year. Thursday or Friday, but she's been to the doctor and everything's fine. And the doctor says right where it needs to be. Um, her, she has more range of motion than she should have at this point. And so things are progressing well for her. I wanted to tell those, um, all of you, but especially in Ms. Kay's class that I got to introduce uh, Ken to David Barton uh, at Creekside this week. Uh, last Thursday we had over at Anderson Mill we had a statewide conference called Impact, which is a it's the best attended thing we do. Um, at the state convention you may have 600 people, and it's all the normal business and preaching and those kind of things. We had. But at the Impact Conference, it's a one-day event. It starts at 9 o'clock in the morning and goes till 4. You have two main sessions and two breakout sessions that are helpful for whatever ministry you may be driving at. And we had a, a little over 900 people uh, for that. And so got to see David um, Barton over there. And that was great. And so we're making arrangements to have lunch with him one day in Columbia. He'll drive up, we'll drive down, and that will be a great thing. While I'm thinking about it, if you are in our men's ministry, which if you're not, shame on you. Um, and if you'll talk to me afterwards, I'll tell you how I can be a part of that. But we usually meet the last Sunday night uh, of the month at 6.15. We did it earlier last month, but we're going to go back, uh, which I think that's the 26th um, this, this month. And we started looking at Ephesians 4, chapter 4. But I want, to, I said, take the first 16 verses when you meet with your groups. And if you have already met, that's fine. But if you have not, I want you to only do the first eight. And for we're going to be in that for the next, that book for the next, and that chapter for the next four months. And Pastor Ken and I are going to tag team that uh, during our Sunday night times. So after everybody talks, the format's the same. After you um, talk about what you have discovered in your groups, he and I are going to tag in and out about some extra things that we have uncovered. So I hope that makes sense to you. Um, what else? Those are some good things that y'all need to know. Uh, back to the prayer concern list. Now, 
Rick had just told me we, as we came in about Glenda Mabry and then I think as after, it might have been before or after that, sometime in that time that we all tried to get wet. So if you'd restate that, please. Okay, Glenda is going to be moving to uh, Simpsonville. It's called Post Acute, Simpsonville Post Acute. It's, it's a rehab center and it's located on Highway 14 is what I'm told. So. Uh, anyway, she will be there, I'm told, for three weeks, probably. And she was either going to be relocated this evening or in the morning. They were still trying to get the paperwork coordinated and arranged when, when I was uh, over at Pelham this afternoon at the hospital. So. Uh, thank you. Um, Pat Genova will have surgery tomorrow. So we need to be remembering her. Has anyone heard from Martin? Yep. Yeah. Okay. What do you hear? Uh, he had his evaluation today and his surgery is scheduled for the 16th. Yeah. Okay. At MUSC? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, Debbie Landine had her surgery last week and is doing well uh, on her foot, but it's uh, going to be a long road. It's about a three-month rehab, and so you need to remember her. Um, who else would you like to mention or that we need to add? Okay. I saw Betty today. She's she's doing she's doing well under circumstances. She really is, and uh, had a nice visit with her, and uh, she seemed she seemed well. You said the eleventh. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Who else? We need to remember my wife. She was moved to uh, Spartanburg to rehab. Yesterday, okay. The doctor thought that she would be there for two to three weeks. Okay. <coughs> and we're glad to see you, Ron. Thank you. Glad to be here. Last time I saw you. <laughs> I was glad I'm back, wasn't I? No, you. But you were sporting a really spiffy gown. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but you looked good, so that was fine. And you looked good because he just had a shower. Yeah. So that was a good thing. Um, and I got to meet his daughter also, and I was glad to meet her. That was good. All right, who else? Joe, you can come over here and swat this thing. I was sending it to you. <laughs> well, I just smacked him, but I don't know where he, where he came back. I spoke with Lois Johnson yesterday. It seems as though Shirley, who has taken the fall in the parking lot, this is going to be a rather extensive uh, recovery. She cannot put any weight on that leg at all. I'm told for probably six months. Wow. And uh, as it stands right now, and, uh, as we know, she has uh, a plate in, in her hip with, with screws. She also has a cracked pelvis mm. and she also has a sciatic nerve problem. So between those three items, it's really uh, been, uh, been a long road for her already. They're making some renovations to their house to make it uh, uh, more user friendly for her for as she goes through this uh, extended recovery process. So it's not a good situation. So she needs to be in her prayers. All right. Anyone else? I saw Nancy Dunn today as well. Uh, she's 
seems to be doing well. She, she tends to be uh, one who, who adjusts well to the circumstances of life. She, she really has. And she's at Woodland Place, uh, but it's just always a joy to go see her. It's an uplifting visit. Uh, she's uh, uh, always uh, very positive and very concerned about her church. So. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Well, let me ask you uh, to pray for the continued di continued direction of our church, for the Lord's leading, and for the ministries of the church. It's there's some exciting things that are happening and some exciting things that are about to happen. Um, as someone who's been in the ministry for a little while, I can tell you that what you long for and live to see, hopefully, is when God impresses on people to do something. And they don't wait to be asked, they don't wait to be told what to do, but they um, feel in their hearts that God is leading them to do things. And so one of those things that has happened in the last year has been the um, upward soccer. And there was an evaluation day last week. And then yesterday there was some continued evaluations. As I was leaving the parking lot um, yesterday afternoon, there was a bunch of kids. And of course I saw Doug out there and some other adults, but Doug's always easily recognizable. Um, and so nobody stands quite like him. And so he, he casts his shadow. And so, and it was, to be honest with you, I, I pulled out, I'm usually parked down here, but I usually exit up at the top uh, because I think I have a better view of traffic from there. And as I was just looking, I just stopped my truck there before I pulled out on the road and just thanked him. Thank the Lord for moving on people and for God to be doing something. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but um, two other things that you may or may not know. But we have some young guys, some of our men who are going over, and I may have told you this, I don't know. But guess what? You're going to hear it again. There's uh, several of our guys who get up on Thursday mornings and go over to an elementary school and are mentors for young people who don't have that kind of influence in their families. And so uh, Seth Buckley introduced us to that when he was here um, last year. And his thing, Fire Pit Ranch, is getting in more and more school districts throughout the state. They now have their own property. There's all kind of work going on there. There's going to be a place where retreats and all happen. And tomorrow night, uh, some of us will be attending the banquet at uh, First Baptist Boiling Springs for Fire Pit Ranch. And some of our guys involved are going to be there. And Joey and um, the pastor and I are going to be there. So that's exciting. In addition to that, and we're going to start recognizing people in services for this kind of thing. Those are heroes of the faith. And we also have some men, some of those who are involved in the fire pit ministry, but, and some others who are looking at a uh, biblically-based alternative to Boy Scouts. And um, I think we're going to be seeing that come here and there's already a lot of talk and a lot of people in the area that have shown an interest in that and that may be another new youth oriented children oriented ministry that we have before too many days so continue to ask God to move in all of these things and celebrate those people get involved where you can and who knows God may move on your heart to do something there was, for years and years and years, and I believe he's still living, there is a Methodist pastor by the name of Jim Ed Matheson over in, it's either Mississippi or Alabama. I've heard him speak personally twice. 
And when you go to his church, which he's retired from the full-time pastor, but he's still an advisor to that church, and he's sought after as a speaker. When you go, they give you a list of like 99 ministries that their church does, and they ask you where you want to plug in. And if you don't find one, they ask you which, well, what ministry would you like to start? <laughs> so their goal is to have 100% involvement. And they got 90-something percent of their memberships involved in ministry in some way. To God be the glory. Amen. To God be the glory. Um, anything else you need to add to the prayer list other than praying that I won't swallow that fly while I'm... <laughs> I did that one time. Uh, I was... I got invited to sing with... take a group and sing in a prison one time. And uh, it was hot and it was a open air kind of thing and the inmates were all out there and we had this little platform we were on and so I'm singing a song and playing a song and uh, there's a little interlude between verses and I took a breath to take uh, to get ready for the second verse of that song and a fly flew right in my mouth and was on the back of my tongue and I so I just whoop. and so I said well Lord we have two options here. We can gag or we can enjoy a little more protein, <laughs> which I did. And uh, then played another interlude and came back in and sang the rest of the song. So I hope we don't have that kind of thing tonight. If there's nobody else, let's pray together about all of these things. <laughs> the Lord Jesus, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you for allowing us again to be here in your house. We thank you that you've brought us together. I think we're all here by divine appointment. We could have been anywhere else tonight, but you've allowed us and you've impressed upon us to be here and we're grateful. Grateful because we get to commune with one another, have fellowship with one another, but most of all because we get to be in your presence and we get to understand a little bit about how you operate. Lord, we have many on this list tonight. We've called a lot of names. We've seen people who are going to an acute care. We've talked about people who are having surgery tomorrow and during this month. We've, we looked at folks who've been moved to rehab who are related to us and to our church family. We look at folks who are having birthdays soon and we want to remember them well. Lord, I may forget them and I could not take the time to read every name and concern that's printed here, either by what was printed or what we have added. So we ask that you would suit a blessing to each need that's represented, and that you would have your way in their lives. I pray that you would be what only you can be in their lives, and allow us to be what you would have us to be. So Lord, I pray that uh, you will move in their lives, and that you would use us as your instruments. Lord, now as we turn our attention to this study, I pray that you would speak, that you would say something to us that when we leave here, we can think about, we can chew on it, we can digest it, and we can make it part of us. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for loving us, for saving us, and for giving us this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're glad to have Tyler and Hannah with us tonight. Uh, most of you have met them. And they've been uh, coming here for a while, and we're just and they're in PS 101. And uh, I hate the giant's not here to see you, um, Joey. I call him the giant, and because um, he's a giant among men, he was a giant in my life on Sunday. Most of y'all did not know this. Some of you uh, know this tonight, but I I think I got food poisoned on Friday night at a conference I was attending, and um, I had a roll there on Saturday. And so I was sick all night Saturday, and I was um, all night Saturday night. And Sunday morning, I came to church. I was not able to do rehearsal Sunday evening. I, uh, I went home after church and slept for um, two and a half hours Sunday afternoon. And I was also Sunday evening to speak in Ennery to a discipleship class, and I did that. And uh, Joey called me. Uh, I just... I woke up from my two and a half hour sleep and he said, 
if you want me to go for you, I'll go. And for some reason, Andy really wanted me to do that this week, or I would have sent Joey. But I appreciated him doing that so much. Tonight I'm going to do something that I don't normally do. First of all, let me just say a little bit about the call. And as somebody new with us, I don't know that I have one of these, but I'm going to give you all one of these. I'll get it for you, and I'll, I'll give it to you. This is a book by Francois Carr, who is a friend of mine in South Africa, who talks about what God has called us to do and what God calls us to be, and you will benefit from just reading the book. But um, so far, and we talk a lot about discipleship, and discipleship is the process of maturing believers in their faith and in their Christian walk. Um, when I was a child, um, when I was first born, I couldn't do anything for myself. People had to do everything for me, feed me, change me, um, whatever and make sure I got the rest, everything I needed. There was a maturing process. As I got older, I was able to do more and more for myself so that I could be a fully functional adult. Same thing in the Christian life. We become babes in Christ at the time of our salvation experience, and then we mature in Him if we follow His injunctions for our life. If we don't, we atrophy. If you leave a child to atrophy, you may not give them the proper nourishment and they may grow in some ways and not in others. They won't be able to do some things that other kids do. Um, they got to have, you got to take care of the whole person. Same thing with your Christian walk. You have to continue to move forward with Christ. The number one thing that Jesus has called us to do is to be with Him. To be with Him. Um, nothing happens until you're with him. I am married now for 43 years. Be 44 years this August. Um, best ticket she ever bought. <laughs> and uh, don't tell her I said that. And, uh, but if I had never asked her out the first time, we would have never got together. If we didn't spend time together getting to know each other during our courtship, our dating years, we wouldn't be what we are today. If we didn't continually spend time together, we would not have grown in our um, relationship. Now, life is a challenge. Marriage is a challenge. The Christian life is a challenge. And without Christ, it is impossible. So the number one food for discipleship, to grow yourself, is first of all to be with Christ and then we recommend being discipled by somebody. I think it takes more than just one thing. I believe in layers of discipleship in more ways than I can shake a stick at. For instance, in this church, I believe that all these ministries can be discipleship paths. I believe Sunday school is one. I believe the men's ministry is one. I believe what the women are doing down the uh, hallway tonight, I believe that's a path. That's a layer of discipleship. What we're doing here, that's a layer of discipleship. And I think everybody needs a chance to plug in to one or as many as they can. Not everybody's going to plug into everything. But wouldn't you rather somebody plug into one thing than nothing? You know, we all are busy people. There's only so much time. But if we can make our, our relationship with Christ our first priority will be amazed at how everything else falls into place. Here's a passage of scripture. Um, John 14, 21 says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself in him. So the true um, marks of a disciple is when Christ begins to manifest himself in them. And that happens in a lot of ways. Last week I gave an example, and I want to revisit that because it's something that happened in our lives, and there is an addendum to the story. Um, so I think y'all are the only ones that don't know this, but 
we are doing some remodeling in our house. It's a process that I do not enjoy. Uh, I fully understand how people in the earthquake zone feel because I've been living in rubble now for a month. And uh, this, the first phase is completed this week and then we have a couple of weeks to breathe the dust and then we will enter into the second phase. And so that's just how that goes. Um, so it's amazing to me how one thing leads to another to leads to another. So it started with a kitchen and den remodel and now it's living room and dining room and, and then, um, and that's just breaking my Scottish heart to be honest with you because you know, you have to spend money to do that. Scottish people don't like that. So, um, so what has been amazing to me is not only what the contractor is doing is, is necessary, but other things are necessary, like the dishes no longer match anything that we have. So that means out with the old and in with the new. And then the TV stand just won't do because it's the wrong type, the wrong color, and so that. So it necessitated the purchase of a couple of pieces of furniture. So I'm at, I'm at a, a furniture store, and I started working with this guy. And uh, I worked with him on both of the purchases that we've made. And the second time when I went in to see him, or the third time, uh, I didn't see him immediately, but another gentleman uh, stepped forward and really started chatting me up because he saw me as an opportunity. And uh, I said, well, I'm looking for, and his face just dropped. So when my salesperson got with me, and at the end I said, well, your big brother up there is really chatting me up. And he said, he's a fine person. His name is Ray, and he's a pastor. And I said, really? And so we started talking. So on the way out, after we'd made our deal, I went up and started talking to Ray. And I said, well, I just walked up to him and I said, I appreciate you greeting me today. And I uh, understand your name's Ray. And he said, yes. I said, I also understand you're some kind of preacher. And he said, yes, I am. Who you been talking to? I said, you, you know who I've been talking to. I've been talking to your little brother back there. And um, so I told him who I was and what I do. And we had a great conversation. Then he says to me, may I ask you a question? And I said, yes. And, and Carol was with me. And he said, I just want to ask you, um, what would you say to a, a young man who has not been in the ministry that long? And without hesitation, I told him, if I had to do it all over again, I would not worry so much about how many musicals I've directed or special programs I've done or what we've been able to put out in front of the people, but I would have spent more time at the feet of Jesus. I always take time to be at the feet of Jesus and don't make a move that you don't consult him first. And then my wife spoke up and said, can I tell you something? Two, he said, yes, ma'am, said, and this is for your wife. Love your wife like Christ loved the church. That's the way he has loved me. Just about made me cry. In fact, when we got out into the parking lot, all I could do was hold her for a minute. And she said, isn't it wonderful when God gives you an opportunity to let him be seen? Yes, it is. So I gave Ray my card, and since last week, we've had two more conversations. And I'm inviting him to staff meeting here with the boys one Tuesday. And he's an African-American brother, and maybe we'll have a chance to speak into his situation too. <coughs> I tell that story um, not in a bragging manner. It has nothing to do with me and Carol. It has everything to do with Jesus and what he'll do for you and what he'll do through you. That's why this verse says, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. There's an old adage that says, if you squeeze oranges, 
you'll get orange juice. If you squeeze lemons, you'll get lemon juice. And if you squeeze a Christian, what should come out is Jesus and the Word. And so I've seen that happen time and time and time again in my own life. And I'm so happy about that. Nothing I've done. Everything that he has. Everything that he has. And so tonight I'm going to do something different. And I'm not going to keep you a long time. I say that every time. But tonight I'm going to not go as far as I wanted to go. Because I want to drive home this point in, in more ways than one. You'll remember for some of you who, who were here the last couple of weeks. In the last section we talked about the law of the second witness. The law of the second witness says that when God moves on you to do something, that He's moving on someone else's heart as well. And when you get there, you find out that God has been working in them. Just recently, we baptized a little girl named Raven. Raven Bridwell. Y'all remember that. So Raven has the Lord had been dealing with her life. And then when her parents started talking to her because God had moved on their hearts to do it, that coincided. The Lord had witnessed in both situations the law of the second witness. That's what that is about. God does that. He'll line things up for you. That's why Henry Blackaby says, find where God is on mission and join him there. When you find where God is working, it's amazing what he's already prepared. I love that. It's, you know, John the Baptist said, prepare you the way of the Lord. Well, guess what? <laughs> he prepares our path as well. So I'm going to read, I'm going to read about three pages here because I think it's important. This is a great story. Um, Francois talks about going to the Hebrides Islands and we know back in the 1940s there was a great movement of God in the Hebrides. Some of you may not know this, but uh, some of Donald Trump's um, uh, ancestors were a part of that. And he actually owns a Hebrides Bible that was part of that revival. Um, just so you'll know that. You need to, there's a video about that where a preacher tells this tale. And you, if I can find it, I'll have a link for you next week. So anyway, he got to go and um, he talks about that great movement of God. And it says, uh, God used many people to pray and prepare for that revival. Duncan Campbell was the preacher God used as an instrument to revival. This is an amazing story. It is interesting to note that before the revival, Duncan Campbell was struggling in his walk with God. Yes, it happens to pastors. God used Duncan Campbell, a pilgrim in the faith mission, um, mightily as he saw revival in Ireland and the highlands of Scotland. Following the revival, he served as a church minister for 24, of 24 years. During that time, he lost the fullness of the Holy Spirit, which he had treasured so, and felt like a failure. He went through a time when prayer was a burden, and the Word of God such a Book, just a book to read. But God was at work in the shadows to bring him back to his glory and fullness. In his book, Catch the Wind, Brad Allen shares how God met with Duncan again. Duncan was sitting in his upstairs study on the 15th of November, 1947, preparing a message he was to preach at the Keswick Convention in Edinburgh. It was 5 a.m. in the morning and he heard singing coming from the parlor downstairs. He sat back and listened to it. It was his 16-year-old daughter, Sheena, who was singing. She sang, coming, coming, yes, they are coming, coming from afar. From the Indies and the Ganges, steady flows that living stream to love's ocean, to his fullness, Calvary, their wondering theme. He made his way downstairs, slipped into the parlor, and sat down. As Sheena sang, something stirred in Duncan's heart. When she had finished singing his song, this song, she came over, sat on his lap and said, Daddy, I would like to talk to you. Duncan replied and said, um, Sheena, I would be happy to talk to you, but first, what is that, what is it that is moving you this morning? 
She even replied, oh, daddy, isn't Jesus wonderful? Duncan asked her, Gina, what, Sheena, what is it that makes Jesus so wonderful to you at 5 a.m. in the morning? Sheena said, Daddy, I have just spent an hour with Jesus, and he is so wonderful. Then she said, Daddy, for several days I have been battling about asking a question, but I, I must do it. Daddy, when you were a young pilgrim with the faith mission, you saw revival. Daddy, why is it not with you now as it once was? Daddy, how is it that you are not seeing revival now? Then Sheena hit Duncan with a crushing question. Daddy, you have a large congregation and many are joining the church, but when did you last kneel beside a poor sinner and lead them to Jesus? He went to the Keswick Convention with a heavy heart and delivered his message, which he later admitted to being glad it was over. God was to use his daughter's question the testimony of Dr. Tom Fitch to convict him. As he walked home, he decided that unless God did something in his heart, unless God gave him back what he had lost, he would resign from the ministry and go into business. After reaching his home, he did not eat supper, but sought the face of God in the study. He prayed and told the Lord, I will not come out to eat or to drink until I am right with you. As I sat listening, this is Duncan Campbell. As I sat listening to Dr. Fitch giving his last message, I suddenly became conscious of my unfitness to be on the platform. I saw the bareness of my life and ministry. I saw the pride of my own heart. How humiliating it was to discover that I was proud of the fact that I was booked to speak at five conventions that year. That night, in desperation on the floor of my study, I cast myself afresh on the mercy of God. He heard my cry for pardon and cleansing, and as I lay prostrate before him, wave after wave of divine consciousness came over me, and the love of the Savior flooded my being. And in that hour, I knew that my life and ministry could never be the same again. If in small measure God has been pleased to use me, it is all because of what he did for me that night. God met with him and brought him back into that glorious experience of the fullness of the Holy Spirit's spirit he once knew. The Lord placed a burden on his heart to evangelize again as he once did. Realizing that God was calling him back into evangelism, his joy seemed to fade. Duncan had unwillingness in his heart to return to, to the ministry of evangelism. He found himself struggling with the question, how would I support my family? His wife had promised their daughter a new coat for her birthday. As he was praying at 2 a.m. in the morning, Sheena opened the door, lay down, on the, lay down on the rug, and after praying with him, said, Daddy, whatever it costs, just go through with God. Sheena continued, Daddy, I believe you are fighting the question whether you should go back to the faith mission. I am fully persuaded that God is asking you to go back. Then Sheena spoke the words that sounded to Duncan like the voice of God himself. Daddy, Perhaps you are wondering how you can look after us. I know that you promised to buy me a new coat for my birthday, but Daddy, Mother will be quite willing to fix my old coat. You needn't buy me a new coat. He had no choice but to surrender and obey God's calling, resign from a position and trust God for the future. In that moment when Duncan had said yes to God, flood tides of glory came over him again and again. In a vision, he saw thousands of people from the highlands and western islands drifting into hell. He heard a voice going to him, calling to him, go to them, go to them. Duncan had a new awareness of the reality of Jesus in his personal life, and it was evident in his preaching from then on. He became the instrument of the Hebrides revival in 1949. <coughs> and then the next thing says, when God is doing his work, he not only works with one person or place, but in several areas, so that his will, agenda, and purposes can be accomplished. God works in all kinds of ways. I want to give testimony to the fact that there's an old hymn that my dad used to sing. My father was the worship leader in, a, in church, and he, he passed away in 2019 at... Um, 89, a little over 89. He led worship in his small church um, until three months before he passed away. And now when I think of him, I think about 
all the things he taught me. We, he, he taught me how to use tools. He taught me how to, how to read music. He taught me how to present myself in a lot of different situations. But what I remember most about it, what I remember most and cherish the most are these two things. In our home, we had a family altar. That's what we called it. I may have told you this, but if so, I won't charge you anything for the second hearing. We had a red sofa in our house. I never will forget this as a kid. And my dad, my mother, my sister, and myself. My sister's 18 months younger than me. And they would gather us on that red sofa, and we would read, my dad would read the Word of God to us. And then we would get on our knees and lean over that sofa, and we would pray. And at the earliest of ages, I remember my dad asking me to pray. And when I, I remember like it was yesterday, when I didn't know, when I said, I don't know what to say, he said, you can say this, and I would repeat it. And you know, later on, it was easier and easier for me to know what to say to God. I also remember the songs that my dad sang. And there's one that I recall, and it said this. Be not dismayed, whate'er that be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. And that has been my testimony through now about 48 years of ministry. I tell people I've been in ministry longer than I've been alive. I have been in church longer than I've been alive because I was in church nine months before I was ever born. <laughs> and so, um, that, but that's my testimony. There have been times when I did not see the path and I did not see the how-tos. There are times I could not understand how this could possibly happen. And at every juncture, God has taken care of me. Every juncture. And at every juncture, and in every path he's led me, he has gone before me. He's gone before me to the point that it's amazing how people are prepared. When I went to the furniture store that night to buy a piece of furniture, I had no idea I was going to meet Ray. I had no idea that I was going to have an opportunity to speak a word about Jesus to Ray. But God's already working in Ray's heart. And, and, he's, and he told me, I've, I've just been looking for somebody to talk to me about Jesus. That's what he's told me in our consequent conversation. And I, I mean, that's just how it is. When God is doing his work, he not only works with one person or place, but in several areas so that his will, agenda, and purposes can be accomplished. Um, when God leads us to somebody, he's been there before us. I'm just reading some quotes that I want you to remember. Um, while God was working, bringing Duncan back to him in the town of Falkirk, God was working in the hearts and lives of some people on the Isle of Lewis in the Hebrides Islands. Amazing what he does. He always uh, prepares a way. And then in, as it goes on in this chapter, he talks about how God worked in the life of Moses and he was working in Moses life and he was working in uh, the life of the Egyptians and the Israelis and the Israelites he was doing all of that he was can God do more than one thing at a time <laughs> is there any number of things that God cannot do at one time no there's not he can he can be in a lot of places um Here's a passage of scripture, Romans 8, 29. Therefore, if I am ever to accomplish my ultimate goal in life, to glorify God, I must be transformed more and more into his image to become like Christ. Romans 8, 29. Um, so how do, you, how do you become more like Jesus? By spending more time with him. By spending more time with him. You, you know... Um, 
They say that people, um, the longer they stay together, the more they look alike. And I think that's true to some point. And I think just like Carol and I have gone places where we were in different segments of a group, but when before people ever knew, they said, you two, you two go together, don't you? <laughs> yeah, we've been going together a long time. <laughs> and so there's something about that. You can tell when people belong together. My question is, are we spending enough time with Jesus that people know we belong with him? If so, when, he, when we get squeezed, he comes out. They'll be able to tell that. Um, here's something from the book. There is no fellowship and intimacy with God where there is no obedience. Elizabeth Elliot said it best. God is God because he is God. He is worthy of my trust and obedience. I will find rest nowhere but in his holy will, which is unspeakably beyond my largest notions of what he is up to. <laughs> I cannot fathom what God is up to. It would blow my mind. But I can know what he wants for my life by spending ultimate time with him. So the law of the second witness and all this goes together. Here's a little summation of where I wanted to go tonight. Moses was chosen to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, and he responded. Sheena was chosen to speak to her father, and he responded. Duncan Campbell was chosen to be a revivalist, and he responded. Jesus was chosen to reveal God's love and reconcile the world to himself, and he responded that he accepted. The disciples were chosen, called, and appointed, and they responded. And they became a blessing to others. And the question is, what about us? Are we a blessing to others because of our relationship with Jesus? So as we embark on a new season in the life of this church, I want you to know that what I want this, when my time is done, I want it to be that people look back and said, during those years, Poplar, Poplar Springs became serious about their relationship with Jesus. And because of that, there are more relationships with Jesus. More people have come to faith and more people are serious about their relationship with Jesus. Let me tell you what, if we get known for that, we'll turn this area upside down. And it won't, because of be, it won't be because of events that we've put on. It won't because, be because of money that we've spent. It'll be because God has been setting a path for us and we've joined Him there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. um, and that's all. I am going to end on time. So I didn't go through all that chapter. I thought I would, but I didn't because I wanted to make sure that we get the point driven home. The law of the second witness. The fact that God is working in more than one place at a time. And when he's working in your life, he's working in another place to bring about his purpose and what he wants done. He'll do that when we yield ourselves. Yesterday was staff meeting day here. Um, those of you in the men's ministry, and I hope all of you will become part of, part of the reason that I'm uh, dividing that chapter more and I'll send out an email about that probably on Friday, um, is because we as a staff are going through that. And we are going to do it just a couple of verses at a time. And so I want to bring all the men along. Th those of you who haven't been with me for a while know that one of the reasons we set this men's ministry in motion we're called fishermen, by the way, because Jesus says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. The reason the fishermen came into being because God laid it on my heart that men were created to be leadership in the church and in our families. And many of us don't know how, and we've given up that birthright without a whimper. And we're going to make sure we become what God intended for us to become. 
So it's a great thing. I hope you'll come be a part of us. We're going to do more than just monthly meetings, but that's where we started, and we're getting to a certain point. So uh, I'm so excited about what God's doing from a spiritual standpoint in these days. In these days, let me tell you this: I'm grateful. Um, the deacons are the care arm of this church through the Jethro ministry. And they are taking that seriously. Rick's the chairman. He's taking it seriously. He, he wants to be a servant leader, and he's stepping up to do that and lead the way. The pastoral staff is the pastoral staff who will lead in spiritual things. We'll be joined by the others, but that's what the role God has given us. Will you just pray for all the leadership of this church that we are exactly, <coughs> excuse me, what God would have us to be? Are you glad you came tonight? I'm sure glad you came. I'm not glad that fly came, but I'm sort of sorry I didn't let Joe make a mess over there. So maybe you take, maybe you could at least drown him. Um, uh, I'm going to give it to somebody who will enjoy him more. I don't want him in my freshly remodeled kitchen. Um, anyway. God is good, and he continues to be so. Bud, why don't you pray us out, and we're done. Father, we thank you that we're able to be here today, this evening. We thank you, Lord, for each and every one who's come. Lord, we, we just need to be hooked, hooked up with you, Lord, and be with you in our sight. Lord, we pray that, that you guide us as a church. We pray that each of us, you guide us, Lord, and that we walk side by side with him and do what he wants us to do. Lord, we, we just thank you for Scott. And we thank you for our pastoral church, our team that brought him to us, Lord. We thank you so much. Lord, we just pray for them. They have a big job, but we have that job as well. <laughs> Being with us, Lord, we pray that we would be more conscious of the fact that Jesus watches over us and that we should walk with him. Lord, we pray for all those who have spoken about tonight. I know there are many folks who are sick, folks who have situations, operations, things such as that. We pray that you would great physician, that you would be each and every one of them, Lord. Lord, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that you saved us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Two things uh, as you're going. First of all, um, I thank you for hearing me tonight. I, you know, I normally try to get everybody talking uh, more, but this was so much a part of my spirit today. I just felt like I needed to do it this way. hope you'll understand. And the second thing is, we're going to try to finish this study in the book of in this book in the month of March so I'm gonna to have to oil my tongue up on both ends and speak fast and you so read ahead and um, I'll look forward to seeing you next time looking forward to Sunday it's gonna be a big day <laughs>